الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد واهتدى ومن يعصهما فانه قد غوى وانه لا يضر الا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا ان خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان خير الامور عوازمها وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد إن شاء الله today to start off this خطبة I would like everyone to think back to the period of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam prior to his hijrah to Medina. So prior to the Nusra coming from Medina for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his Sahaba to migrate there, the Dawah and the Message of Islam started in Mecca and it remained in Mecca for 13 years. 13 years of the Muslims being the extreme minority among the people. 13 years of the Muslims being oppressed, being persecuted, being tortured, many being martyred, some having to leave Mecca because they could not handle the persecution, Muslims being boycotted. Through these 13 years, the Muslims faced hardship after hardship. Now during this period of time, when the Muslims were facing severe conditions year after year, a group of the Sahaba, the companions of Rasulullah وسلم, they left Mecca and they migrated to Abyssinia, to Habasha. So the land in East Africa, today would be Ethiopia, Eritrea, a group of the Sahaba, they traveled to Habasha. And at the time it was a Christian land ruled by a Christian ruler at Najashi and they went over there to seek protection from him to seek refuge in that land of al Habasha. So the Quraysh of Mecca, the ones who were doing this oppression and this persecution on the Muslims they knew and they heard of this that a group of the Muslims were going to leave and try to have protection in Habasha. The Quraysh had a relationship already with that king and one of the men who particularly had the relationship with him was Amr bin As, who was eventually, he eventually became a great Sahabi, but at the time he was not a Muslim. At the time he was not a Muslim, and he was actively working against the Muslims at this, at this point in the, in the life of the Prophet. So Amr bin As, at this time not a Muslim, and another man from the Quraysh, when they heard about the Muslims leaving to Habasha, them two together were also sent to Habasha to stop the Muslims from getting that protection. So they could talk to the king of Habasha who they already had a relationship with and tell him not to accept them into their land, not to give them that protection. So now when they're in the place with the king of Habasha, the two men from Quraysh as well as the group of Muslims, they're all together, it was customary for the people at the time in that land to bow down to their king. So the people who were there, who were already from that land, they bowed down to the king, as well as the two men from Quraysh, including Amr bin al-As, they bowed down to the king. This was the customs for them, they bowed down to him. The Muslims on the other hand, coming from years of persecution, coming from severe persecution, they're looking for that place to seek refuge, their first interaction with this person who they're trying to seek that refuge with, they don't bow down to him. They refuse to bow down to him because this is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will only bow down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their ibadah is only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will not show that respect that they show only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a human being. 
So the Muslims in this situation, right off the bat, they traveled for days and days to get to this land to find that protection. They will not bow down to it. So that's just the first first instance that happens in this meeting with al Najashi. They refuse to bow down to him. They don't back down from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught them and commanded them through the Quran and the Sunnah thus far. And Umar bin al-As and the other man from the Quraysh, they use this against them. They try to use this against them in front of the king of Habasha, that look at how they are disrespecting you. They will not even bow down to you. And he moves on to continue to try to put that uh, enmity between them. He tells al Najashi, they, these people who are coming to seek protection from you, because he is a Christian king, they do not believe that Isa alayhi salam is the son of God. They don't believe that Isa alayhi salam is the son of God. So he's trying to do whatever he can to put the Christian ruler against the Muslims here. Now from the group of Muslims in this situation, one of the Sahabi, one of the Sahaba stepped forward. This was Ja'far bin Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu. A cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the brother of Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. He steps forward and again in front of this king, he has not backed down from the stances that Islam has defined for us. In front of the king, when they're asked about what they believe about Isa alayhi salam, he recites ayat from Surah Maryam, explaining the belief and the conviction that the Muslims held about Isa alayhi salam, that he was not a son of God, rather he was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Ja'far bin Abi Talib did. He recited the ayat of the Qur'an directly. He did not back down. He did not change his stance so that they could seek that protection. He did not think that, you know, if we change things a little bit, then inshallah we'll reach that end goal. The end goal we're trying to get is just, the end goal we're trying to get is righteous. We're trying to get that protection. So it's okay if we change stuff a little bit along the way. This was not the mentality. The mentality was regardless of the situation we are in, regardless of the consequences we might face because of it, Islam is our basis and that's definite. We don't change Islam to try to achieve uh, a larger goal. We don't change the method of how we go about things to try to achieve a goal for the sake of Allah. That everything we do from the process we go about it to the goal we're trying to achieve all together must be in line with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Must be in line with the Quran and the Sunnah. So they did not compromise or hide or twist parts of the deen. Sometimes it becomes very easy to think that when we want to present Islam to others, that we'll, we'll hide certain parts of the deen, we can discuss it with them later, they might not like certain parts of what Islam says. This was not the mentality of the Sahaba in this situation, because they held that deep conviction in Islam. Right? Let's think about what, what makes them in this situation where they've traveled for days and had years of persecution, and they're looking for that protection, and that protection is an arm span away. And they, are think, and they are willing to put all that on the line if that means they have to stand, continue to stand up for what Islam has commanded them to do. Continue to stand up for what is already defined for them in the Quran and the Sunnah. And that comes from having that conviction of Islam already built from that foundation which is the Aqeelah. If we think about it, at this point, in the seer, right? The Quran was revealed over a span of 23 years. The Sahaba did not become Muslims all after 23 years. They waited for the whole Quran to be revealed and then they became Muslim. No, they were becoming Muslim along the way. Throughout those 23 years, people were becoming Muslim. What made them accept Islam, even though Islam was not fully there yet? What made them accept Islam? The Quran was not complete, it was still being revealed. What made them accept Islam and also accept whatever comes forward, that comes forward after that? That there are more ayat revealed, they're going to accept those two as soon as they come. What put that in their hearts? That every single thing we do, it's sami'na wa ata'na, we hear and we obey. This is what the, the conviction and the aqidah of Islam does, that they had an understanding, they had a rational understanding that there must be a creator. That there must be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there, and that He is in control, and that He exists, that the Creator exists. And that what He tells us to do comes from the Qur'an, and that the Qur'an itself is miraculous in its nature. That the Qur'an itself was the miracle that gave them that conviction. That they understood the language of the Qur'an was unlike anything ever seen. And that till this day, no one has written anything that matches the linguistic beauty of the Qur'an. This is what gave them that conviction in the deen to the point that that was the foundation, that's all they needed to know. 
We know the examples of Umar ibn al-Khattab for example, that he only had to read a few ayat of the Qur'an to become a Muslim. He didn't read the entire Qur'an, the entire Qur'an was not there yet. Many of the Sahaba were shuhada, they lost their lives before the entirety of the Qur'an was revealed. But when that foundation was there, anything that comes after it, it سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear and we obey. Anything that comes after it. And when we present it to others, when we present this deen to others, it is also in its completeness. We can present it completely. We don't hide any part of it. We don't think that if we hide parts of it, that's going to you know, help us get to a larger goal, so it's okay. Everything from the process to the end goal, all together is in line with Islam. And we see this in the lives of many of the other Sahaba as well. We see that Sahaba like Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anh, he was tortured. In, on the, he was laid on the hot sand of Mecca with a boulder on his chest. And they would torture him. And all he would say was, Ahadun Ahad, that Allah is one. We know the stories of Ali Yasser, the family of Yasser, Sumayyah bin Khayyat, radiallahu anha, the first person who was martyred in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can think about these things and reflect on them. What made her willing to put her life on the line for this deen? And she was the first one, by the way, if we put that even into more perspective. It's not like right now where we're looking back and thinking to the example of the Sahaba and saying, let's be like them. There was no precedent for that. It was not her saying, I've seen others do this, so I'm going to do it too. It was not her saying, you know, this is what's happening with everyone. She was the very first one. What put that conviction in her heart so strong that it doesn't matter if nobody else has ever, has ever lost their life for this cause. It doesn't matter if anyone else ever will. But I have such a deep understanding of this. I have such a deep conviction of this that I am willing to put my life on the line for this cause. This was the case of the Sahaba at this time. We know famous examples where they did not care what others thought of them in these situations. They stood for their deen regardless of what the people of Mecca thought of them. Abdullah bin Mas'ud was a very famous example of this. That he would go in front of the Quraysh, he would go openly in Mecca, and he would recite ayat of the Quran. And he was, if, uh, if you guys know about Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he was physically a very weak Sahabi. Physically, he was very weak. Yet he would go openly in front of the Quraysh and he would recite the Qur'an. The famous example when he went openly in Mecca and recited Surah Rahman in front of them. And he began reciting. And when he was reciting openly, the Quraysh came and they started beating him. And he started beating him. And his face was getting bloody. He was getting hurt, he was being harmed, and he continued reciting. And when he came back to the Sahaba afterwards, they told him, this is what we feared was going to happen if you went and did this. We feared this was going to happen. You went and recited the Qur'an publicly in front of these people that hate to hear it. And his response to them was, Wallah, Wallah, the enemies of Allah are not more comfortable than how comfortable I am right now. After being beaten severely by them, he said, they are not more comfortable than me right now. His face is covered in blood. He's saying, they are not more comfortable than me. And he said, if you like, I'll go out tomorrow and I'll do the same thing again. I'll go tomorrow and I'll do the same thing again. It doesn't matter how much they beat me. I'll do the same thing again. And the Sahaba told him, you've done enough. You made them hear what they dislike. You made them hear what they hate to hear. This was the mentality of the Sahaba at this time. Regardless of how small they were in numbers in compared to the people of the Quraysh. They never backed down from what Islam had taught them to do. They never backed down from the, uh, the stance that Islam instilled in them. Because that foundation of the aqidah that was there, it built everything on top of that. Anything that came with that, it was automatic after that. Because once you have that conviction in the foundation, everything else, once again, it's we hear and we obey. Everything else after that, we understand immediately. If we have an obligation, we will go about that obligation. If we have a stance given to us from Islam, we will stand firm on that stance, regardless of who does not like it. Regardless of the reaction it may receive from others. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Qur'an, in regards to presenting this deen in front of others, He mentions to us, فَلَا تُطِعِ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ وَدُّ لَوْ تُدْهِنُ فَيُدْهِنُونَ That do not obey the deniers, the one who deny our deen. They wish that you would soften in your position, so that, you, so that they would soften towards you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is directly telling us in the Qur'an, when we interact with others, 
who interact with those who are not Muslim, those who deny the deen, that there is a desire from them to make you soften in your stance so that they will soften towards you. They want to see you compromise. They want to see you give up part of your deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us about this directly in the Quran. This is what they want from us, but we cannot fall in this trap. Because this is not the purpose of the message that was sent. The purpose of this message was not sent for us to take parts of it and leave other parts of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the message directly, tells us what the purpose of this message was. In multiple ayat in the Quran, he tells us, that he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the one who sent his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with guidance and the deen of truth, the true way of life, the true system of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah is giving us the purpose of why he even sent down this message. That this is to dominate over all other ways of life. This is to prevail over all other deens, all other systems of life. Islam was sent to prevail over all others. Once again, this is exactly what we see in the lives of the Sahaba. Regardless of what the mushrikeen think of it, regardless of if they dislike it. Those who associate partners with Allah, regardless of if they dislike it, this is the purpose of this deen. This is the purpose of this message being sent down. To the purpose of this message being sent down was to dominate over all other ways of life. To be that example. To be the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent for all of mankind. For all of mankind to experience the mercy and justice of Islam. And now the reason I bring up this topic today of standing firm in our deen and standing firm in our stances and learning this from the example of the Sahaba is because they were in situations, very tough situations in which they were, they were for, almost forced to go against their deen they were put in high pressure situations where they were asked to go against their deen they could have given up at any moment unfortunately the Muslim Ummah is in many similar situations today where they're continue, we are continuously pushed to back down from the stances that we hold we are continuously pushed to move away from what Islam has taught us that there are more modern ideas that we can accept that there are certain methods that we can go about to achieve the solutions we're trying to achieve Yet we remember as Muslims that our honor comes from Islam alone. Our honor comes from Islam. As Umar bin al-Khattab famously said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the, the Arabs of the time, they were a disgraced people. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He honored them with Islam. He gave them Islam to, and He honored them through it. And if they seek honor through anything else, through anything else, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will disgrace them again. And we can learn from this today in the many situations we face all around, in every aspect of life, since Islam addresses every aspect of life for us. We see where we are pushed to go into a corner, where we are pushed to change our stances. And we see this even in the unfortunate situation we see today across the Muslim world when we look to Palestine, when we look to Gaza, when we look to the continuous oppression that the Muslims have faced there. It's been over two months now. Today is the, I believe, the 69th day since October 7th, since that heightened violence against Palestine, against Gaza. Not the start of it, because we know October 7th is not when it began. This oppression has been going on for decades. For over two months now, the Muslims have faced this oppression. When we stand up and we call for solutions to Gaza, just as the Sahaba, regardless of what situation they were in, they stood firm in what Islam taught them, in what the Qur'an and Sunnah guided them towards. We must do the same. When we talk about Gaza, when we talk about any situation we face, regardless of the situation we're in, the method that we go about 
when we, when we call for solutions to Gaza, when we want to see the liberation of Palestine, the solutions that we go about to achieve that must be in line with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us. What we see in the Quran and the Sunnah, what we see from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just as Ja'far bin Abi Talib did not change what their beliefs were, did not present differently what their beliefs were, did not even hide what their beliefs were in front of the king, he could have recited any ayat of the Quran in front of him. He specifically in front of this Christian king who could have told them, expelled them, go back to your homes. Who could have done anything to them at that moment. He was at their will. He recited to them the ayat of the Quran specifically about Isa alayhi salam. Saying that Isa alayhi salam is not the son of God but Isa alayhi salam was a prophet of Allah. This was how the Muslims reacted in these situations. So when we call for these solutions to Palestine in the same way, we do so in line with the Quran and Sunnah. We do not change how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has presented to us what liberation looks like. We do not change what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has presented to us as what seeking justice in Palestine looks like. Just as the Muslims did not take the disbelievers of the time, they did not change what they, what, they, what they stood for to take them as allies, we do the same today. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in many ayat, for example, where he tells us in Surah uh, An-Nisa يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَتَّخِذُوا الْكَافِرِينَ أَوْلِيَاءَ مِنْ دُونِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَتُرِيدُونَ أَنْ, أتريدون أن تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ سُلْطَانٌ مُبِينًا As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, O oh, you who believe, do not take the disbelievers as allies instead of the believers. Would you like to give Allah solid proof against yourselves? This is the weight of these situations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is questioning us in this ayah. Would you like to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a proof against yourself? To take a disbeliever as our allies over the believers. So when, we, when, we, when we're in any situation where we have to present Islam, where we present the solutions, whether it be for Palestine, whether it be for any situation, we go about this in line with how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines it for us. And we see, and we see that specifically in the situation for Palestine, we call on the Muslims. These should be our priorities, that we call on the Muslims to make a change. That we need to be talking about this. We need to continuously be talking about this. As I mentioned, we're over two months now since this situation. The first time I gave a khutbah about Palestine here, it was in October. Now it's, we're, we're halfway through December now. Regardless of how long the situation goes on, we continue to speak about it, and we continue to speak about it in the same manner. We don't change it, and we continue to make sure that others continue to speak about it. And as the ayah mentions, we do this with the Muslims. We call upon the Muslims who have the ability to make a change, to make that change for us. Because what we are trying to achieve, the liberation of Palestine, at the end of the day, comes at the hands of the Muslims. That justice can only come from the hands of the Muslims. Because justice is defined by Islam and defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that cannot change at any point when we are standing up or calling for this. And I have, I have a little more to say, but I'm running out of time here. So, I'll call the call of 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 Allahumma <laughs> اللهم صل على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى سائر الصحابة والتابعين وعلى عبادك الصالحين اللهم أيد الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أنصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وجعلنا منهم واخذل من خذل دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا تجعلنا منهم 
اللهم أين الحق حقا وزقنا اتباعه وأين الباطل باطلا وزقنا اجتنابه اللهم ثبتنا على الإسلام اللهم نوع قلوبنا بنور الإيمان اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيداء إلى القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون واذكروا الله يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم وذكر الله تعالى أعلى وأولى وأعز وأجل وأتم وأهم وأكبر أقيم الصلاة